In 2000, the very first uh, systematic review of alcohol prevention and intervention uh, programs for college students was published. And uh, so these were articles with a comparison group and that measured some drinking outcome. This first systematic review. Any idea how many articles there were in uh, 2000? Well, uh, so there's 15. There was 15. And so you, so that's a number you can sort of wrap your, uh, wrap your mind around and figure you could do, you know, on paper with a calculator and, you know, sort of make stacks of articles. In fact, the review placed uh, articles into three main categories, educational, attitudinal, and skills-based approaches. And the, uh, this narrative review um, found that educational approaches showed the least effect, and then other kinds of attitudinal and skills-based approaches showed roughly equivalent and modest reductions. Uh, and also found that program duration was uh, relatively unrelated to outcome. So on average, um, your shorter term programs were more or less as effective as longer term programs. The review ended by bravely concluding that, quote, there were several effective tools for reducing college drinking, uh, but also had a lot to say, complaints about methodological differences between studies, uh, that it was difficult to tell what was actually done in the program, that the authors poorly reported outcomes, many of the same problems were uh, experiencing today. So as a field, um, we have come a long way in some sense, but in another way it's still frustrating to try and get the data to, to tell us what we wanted to tell us. Uh, Emily today described 190 studies in a previous meta-analysis and then 134 new studies since 2014. So that's 324 that I did right from my seat there, 324. My uh, recollection is maybe was when I was in graduate school in the late uh, 1990s, 324 is probably the total number of studies in the whole alcohol field. Uh, I mean, it was certainly in the hundreds. So it's just amazing to me to think that now we have that number specifically with young adult and college drinking. It's just amazing to be at this particular time. Um, and really, the sophistication of these current uh, efforts is really breathtaking. I mean, it's totally different than uh, 20 years ago in, the, in terms of the way that we're organizing and approaching the data. Um, in particular, uh, I think there's a couple of things uh, that were talked about today that are going to be a huge advantage uh, to the field. One thing is uh, this ability to match individual and aggregate data together. Um, and that's going to help us to extrapolate beyond what was simply reported in the article. Uh, and it's also going to be really useful for perhaps extrapolating into other prevention areas. Quite a lot of the research I heard at this conference was structured along the ways that we uh, see data here with lots of zeros and a big, you know, high uh, uh, sort of lagging risk curve, um, lagging use curve. And uh, so I think some of the tools that are com coming from this study are going to provide really interesting ways to analyze this data that currently we experience as just simple uh, standard deviations and means. Um, and I was, I was thinking about this um, reading in the paper today about the, the move to 5G, uh, you know, 4G to 5G, and people are saying, well, really what difference is, is it going to make? Well, with 1G, uh, you got wireless voice. With 2G, you got texting. With 3G, you get internet finally on your phone. With 4G, now you have continuous location apps. So all of these things that ability to get Uber and Lyft and Maps, you know, how we got to dinner last night, all of these things became available with 4G. Um, so that's a little bit of what I think is going to be the advantage of, of knowing what's the connection between um, the aggregate data and the individual data. And that's going to help us extrapolate beyond just simply this group of studies to lots of other contexts as well. So uh, it might be useful, really, for answering new questions. So for instance, this matching of, uh, of studies that EY was talking about, why would you find another study to determine whether the effectiveness of web-based feedback is modified by depression and gender identity? Probably the data is already there, but it's in like two or three or four studies. And so what you need to do is match those studies, and all of a sudden you'll be able to answer that question without funding yet another study to look at some uh, compilation of web-based feedback for a particular population, a particular uh, setting. We've probably already got that data. Um, we just need to make better use of it. And finally, uh, from an intervention designer standpoint, uh, the idea of mediation or process data is really interesting to me, explaining why these things are happening. How can we extrapolate to develop new interventions? Um, so I do uh, speak from the uh, perspective of an intervention designer and implementer. So I think of things that are beyond simple raw effectiveness, beyond the data. 
And that, I think, is maybe the next thing, um, maybe beyond this study or perhaps as a supplement to this study. Um, you know, which one is cheapest? Which is easiest? Which one is quickest to implement? Is it commercially available? Uh, is it going to be attractive to decision makers, the people who actually fund the programs, uh, to parents, to students, to donors? Uh, all these things, uh, these groups of people have their own sometimes competing agendas. And it's really too important to understand how valuable these programs are apart from just simply what the data is telling us. I don't know really exactly what I'm asking for, but it seems like uh, something like this would be the next step in understanding really how important this data is. Um, and uh, so I, I can tell you from um, serving on the project, that's one of the things that I think is the most difficult for me is that it's sometimes difficult to understand, even if you have complete data, what was actually done in the intervention. Um, sometimes the intervention description is very thin. It's a function of journal space and who wrote what section and the person who did the intervention wasn't the person who wrote the journal article and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so I think that's an opportunity for the field in general to approve on reporting of what was actually done. Um, for instance, I'm often asked for data for my studies. I'm sometimes asked what I did, uh, but I don't think anybody has ever uh, interviewed me qualitatively about what it was like. What was the setting like? What was the demeanor like? What order were these things done in? Um, what parts do I think, uh, you know, when I, as an interventionist, I design interventions that have a certain rhythm to them. And you might say that it's all the same, but it's really not. You know, there's a certain thing that happens at the beginning, in the middle, and the end. It has to work like a melody or like a, like a volleyball game. You can't just tell a volleyball player, well, just hit the ball back. Well, but there's a certain rhythm of, you have to bump it up, someone sets it to the front, the third person spikes it. And interventions are like that too. Um, so I think um, the next step maybe is, uh, you know, even when we have good data, we have to understand what was actually done in the intervention. It has a whole le level to it. And that, I think, is going to help us move to the, uh, the 5G field. Um, so kudos to EY and this team. Um, uh, really, uh, I mean, there are not many teams like this that range from uh, theoretical statistics to implementation people that are talking um, to each other. So I, I think that's really exciting. And so these are some of the things that excite me about this talks and this project. Um, I think they're going to help us to understand the forest, understand the trees, and under uh, help us to understand why we're in the forest to begin with. So thank you all. <laughs>